It's me, Vera, here to remind you that this is an adult podcast. That means we're going to deal with tough topics. Take a break if you need it, and be kind to yourself, because we sure won't be. And welcome to stuff. Oh, almost said the wrong name of the oh, wrong show. It's our first one. Well, I gotta switch. My well, brain's got to switch. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Cracked incredible. Crown, a Vampire the Masquerade fifth edition podcast. As always, I am your storyteller, Mike Martin. Today, joined by my four new regular players, Dot, Mark, <laughs> Josh, and Bub. Hello to all of you. But before you can say a word, Hello. shut up. We have a more special guest here. <laughs> he decided to rejoin us after being a guest at our live Gen Con show. It's none other than Jason C. Miller himself. Hey, hey Jason, welcome to the show up, again. I thought I'd get into character for uh, for Bob today. You are Nailed it. the more you cosplayed harder than anyone else here, uh, and uh, you put them all to shame. Um, yeah, welcome to Crack Crown, everybody. This is a season one of a new show. Yes, you're seeing the characters from Stitch of Fate, uh, but for this show, as I've said in the past, um, Stitch of Fate is more of like. I kind of see it as a very detailed character origin story for these for these four characters. And as we move into Cracked Crown, you don't have to listen to Stitch of Fate to understand what we're about to do here, but it does add depth. Uh, before we get all of that, we have so many things we want to talk about and cover. First and foremost, we have another show coming. I know we've announced it a little bit. Uh, we talked a little bit about it in our Scott Free show recently, tweeted about it, but let's say here uh, up on our main show, SOS, Shadows of Sybil, the, the third and final season for the trio of seasons that we were putting together over on Roll For It is going to be done, finally. After two years, uh, Roll For It has been kind enough to uh, give us like the opportunity to finish that story out, do it here on Pod by Night Twitch channel. And after the Twitch VODs, if you, don't, if you miss them, you can watch them immediately on our Twitch channel via sub. Or you can wait a couple days and it'll be over on their YouTube channel for free. That's youtube.com slash roll number four it. Uh, we basically made that decision because that's where the first two seasons are and might as well have that last one there and keep everything in one YouTube channel and not like scatter the content everywhere. Uh, it'll be just like before. It'll be 24 episodes, four hours each, and it'll be the final chapter for the loud ones. We will finally see their story come to its arc conclusion and, uh, I mean, I've had this in my head for like six years total now. I'm, it, it all started with just around the corner, and it's finally time to close that thick book uh, of, of a story. I guess uh, you, you could will say see we've some... rounded the corner, right, Mathis? Hey, we've rounded the corner, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we'll see some returning faces. Obviously, we'll have Tracy, Bub, and Dot reprising, reprising their main roles, but you're going to see Josh on the show occasionally, and you're going to see Maggie on the show again occasionally, and who knows, whoever else we can kind of rope in as needed. Um, but again, we're just so excited because that's that's the show that got us started. That's the show that got us together uh, as people who we never had met each other until we played that game together. And it was like lightning in a bottle. So, true uh, story. yeah, if you guys uh, if you guys don't know what that is, go onto their YouTube channel and watch the first two seasons. There's a lot of content there. I think there's 30 episodes in the first season and 50 episodes in the second. So it's a lot um, beyond that. Uh, if you are looking to support this show. We want to. We're going to be paying our cast of that show, obviously, through Pod by Night, and the best way to support that is through Twitch subs. Uh, that is going to go directly to paying that cast specifically, since they are not part of technically the Pod by Night kind of umbrella. Uh, and if you want to support us above, above, above and beyond, Patreon.com/slash Pod by Night. You can get extras there, become part of the community game that's been going on, uh, and a ton of other stuff, including I think Dot actually just kind of spit shine the whole patreon and, and tighten um, it up a little bit it's very visceral mathis thank you for that <laughs> uh, i did i spit shined our patreon uh yeah it was great i added some merch options so at our 50 dollars tier and our top 100 dollars tier there's some new custom merch that you cannot get in our merch store it comes only to you via patreon and uh you get it after i think of three months you get your first shipment after three months of support so uh, stick with us and we'll treat you to some pretty pretty sweet stuff. I can say 
that uh, what the what's the rumpus hoodie is in the mix for some yeah. of them. So you can get your hands on a what's the rumpus hoodie simply by supporting us. So uh, very cool. Go check it out. It's all like you said, spit shine. And we have some new goals as well. Uh, yes, so we some of those goals include another show, um, include another live show. Um, so don't uh, don't miss out on it. Go check it out. Please, yeah, check that stuff out. Um, I feel like there was something else I was supposed to cover as well, and I can't. Is that everything? Did I get everything? I mean, I think that's the big stuff. Uh, the, if you're interested in SOS, you'll see us at the top of December. Mark your Saturdays in yes. December, everybody. Saturdays in December, 4 p.m. EST is when we begin the show uh, in the evenings. That may change about halfway through, but you'll have plenty of warning before times change, if, if they change at all. Uh, okay, cool. Well, with that uh, all off of our shoulder, I am very excited to see the Drag Pack back together again officially and uh, see what exactly or should I say, see how exactly Chicago welcomes you. So with that said, let's rein it in, set the scene, and see what our coterie is up to. As the screen fades in from dark, we're blinded with passing streetlights rapidly passing us by. Civilians fill the sidewalks, drinking, talking, and having a relatively nice night out on this Friday evening. Cars pack the streets and the honking of horns in the distance can almost overwhelm the chatter of the people on the outside. But all of that is background noise. We see a large moving vehicle rush by, just catching a yellow light before it turns red, turning right at the next intersection. We tail this vehicle with rusted out, uh, a rusted out license plate holder with it dangling by a single screw and a clearly a uh, rear left flat tire that makes a warbling sound as it continues down the pavement. Eventually, though, in sight, we see a large brick building. It crawls into view. But before we can see the sign on that, all of the outside goes mute. That light disappears and is replaced with a dim darkness. And crammed in the back of this vehicle, we see Kindred. Vera. For those who may be joining this show for the first time, what does Vera look like and what is she doing? Um, Vera might be considered the thorn to the rose. Beautiful, but the way a black snake is beautiful. Um, she wears all black vinyl leather from head to toe. Uh, her shoes come to a daft point, as do her fingernails uh, that match. Uh, she's a bit sharp in her appearance around the edges, and she wears her hair up in a tight bun under a massive hat uh, that covers a large portion of her face. Uh, she tends to find that it is her greatest weapon, and though, and thus she must keep it sheathed. I imagine in the moment she's standing just gazing upon the other kindred that sit in the back of this truck. You've been in this truck now for a good four hours or so on this last leg of the journey. And speaking to one another are two other kindred, a absolute dichotomy in their size. One stands with a plain white shirt and khakis at a 6'7", I believe. Speaking 6'9". Nine. 6'9", nine, I apologize. My, uh, it's, it, my uh, knowledge on that was off a little. And below him, maybe sat down and crouched or maybe he, uh, leaning against a wall, is a younger looking man. If you were to gaze on him and take a guess, his early 20s, maybe. Bub and Josh. What do your characters look like? And I imagine they're speaking with each other in a rather involved conversation as this journey nears its end. Duke, Duke tries not to speak as much right at this moment. He's really trying to figure out just how much Sean has changed in the time that he's known him from the very beginning to this very point. Um, standing there in his, his, his beige or cream colored, uh, dickies and and the the button down that's been pressed finely tucked into his pants uh the hair parted at the side the mustache ever tapered just right and the glasses really just highlighting his sharp blue cold eyes he asks sean how do you know sean how do you understand it when you do the things that you're capable of doing now when i was taught i had i had a teacher my sire but you, please explain it to me. There's a bit of a confused look on Sean's face as he thinks really hard. Um, and he is 
yeah, he's kind of sat down, knees uh, up, and is kind of uh, leaning forward on them. And you see him looking with kind of shabby chic. You're not entirely sure if he is uh, intentionally slightly, uh, uh, what's the word, unkempt. Um, but he has like scraggly and like slightly curly, dark, dark brown hair and um, a, a very skinny, slim build um, with quite, at this point, intense eyes. Um, and he blows a, a, a stream of smoke into the top of this van and just... You know, Duke, I never really thought about it too much when I was using... You know how I could steal powers from people? Yes, yes, I'm familiar. Those came pretty natural. I don't... Things seem fixed now. I don't, I don't really... I don't really know. What, ha what happened on the way here... I felt stronger, but only because I was really, really angry. So can you not do the same things that you were previously? With the blood, I mean. I've tried. You know, the cigarette thing? Mixing doesn't work. People react differently when I feed them. I can't extract the blood I need from them. It feels like I, I, I can still taste the emotion and the the ingredients but like i don't know there's some secret sauce that i don't have anymore mm. well i think it's probably it's safe to assume at this point that we should keep this uh close to the cuff a bit of a secret we don't need people knowing that you've changed so much you're still well in this case where we're going sean the ventru yeah yes What's the most venture thing I can do to stay on the DL? Hmm. Honestly, Sean, I'm probably the worst person to ask that. I'm not a very good venture myself, but... This being a, a relatively small back of the truck, obviously Vera and Max, who I imagine has sat in the corner. He's got a cat on his shoulder, completely devoid of fur as it's perched comfortably, balancing deftly. Uh, and him, he too, I, much like Sean, has a cigarette dangling from his fingers. I don't know if Max wants to say anything, but just to set the scene, um, and our dear Bob Kowalski, uh, if I remember correctly, sitting a shotgun uh, up front. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, Max, Max is a monster. There ain't no getting around that. He don't look remotely human. Even his body. Very wide shoulders, but the body itself emaciated. His face is bat-like. Huge pointed ears. Strange, feral cast to his features. Yellow eyes. But he sucks on his cigarette and flips through a very, very well-worn copy of Detective Comics number 27. He's dressed in uh, dark, shabby clothes, an overcoat. It's open, though, and you can see he's got a flak jacket underneath. Lots of weapons strapped to him. Yeah. In a more relaxed mood, he'd be wearing a bathrobe. But, uh, this is business. Hey, Bob, how's it going up there? As there's a uh, bang on the, the metal as uh, Max shouts back, interrupting the conversation between Duke and Sean at that moment. And as the camera blurs through that metal lining, uh, stopping uh, sight of the two, we see an old man sat on, in the driving wheel, hunched forward, eyes squinted as though it's having a hard time seeing. The rain has long stopped at this point, hours ago. 
And as he turns uh, right, he actually nicks the curb. The whole truck bobbles up and down just for a minute. But John, this 90 some odd year old man who's missing almost all of his hair, uh, doesn't seem to notice as it goes right. Sat next to him is another kindred, one that those listeners of Stitch of Fate may not be familiar with. As he sits there, before he describes how he looks, he joined the Coterie not long ago. Along their route to Chicago, they were intercepted. Word of Kindred having fleeing New York had clearly crawled its way across the West Coast. And as they were interrupted, this Kindred laid upon them a task. Show loyalty to the Camarilla that you're not as... Violent, perhaps, is the word I'm looking for, as the rumors show, and that there is still loyalty in you, and he can get you a meeting with Prince Kevin Jackson to declare yourselves within Chicago. And so you did. It was messy. It was bloody, and something was looking for Sean. But whatever it was was put down by the five of you. And this particular kindred deemed your job good enough to bring you into Chicago. Jason, who is your character and what does he look like? As he sits next to old John driving this truck into Chicago. There was a garbage truck outside my house. So first of all, when you hear Max, when you hear Max bang on the on the on the, on the wall there, you hear him go, "Hey, I take that turn there." No, not that one. That one. <laughs> John and, uh, mumbles to himself something, but you don't really know what he says. You see uh, a, a guy, he's decked out in all sorts of Chicago gear. He's got the Chicago Bulls hat. He's got the Chicago Bears t-shirt. If, uh, if I had it, this would be an authentically licensed Chicago Cubs jacket. So just use your imagination. But uh, he was turned in right after the, the Bears won the Super Bowl in 1986. And he often jokes, uh, if he if he didn't get turned, he probably would have died of a heart attack in 1987. So uh, he's happy. To, he's just happy to be here. But uh, working for the prince, uh, you guys proved yourselves pretty good to him. So uh, you know, thought we'd take it to the next step. Uh, after you tell him to take the right, you can see the hotel that the planned meeting is to take place at. Actually, just a block up. We're almost there. You hear that through the muffled metal, but you can understand all four of you can hear. We're almost there. Okay, fair enough. Max stubs his cigarette out on the wall of the van and folds up this, what in mint condition would be a priceless comic, just stuffs it into an inside pocket uh, of his trench coat and uh, straightens it up. Okay, so. New digs, huh? So... Duke has planned for us, and between Vera's feet is a bucket. It's like, and it's full of goo. We've brought it the whole way here. And Vera stops kind of clacking her fingernails in impatient uh, state and says, I'm just glad to get there because whatever this is is spilling on my boots. Mm. Yeah, you're going to need the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the quicker picker-upper to get that spit off. Spit shine will do it. What is it with all of the spit? It is a beautiful hotel, though. Vera kind of peers out of the window uh, and looks at their new home, which is bigger and nicer than their last one. This whole Chicago thing's really working out for them. <laughs> Vera, can I get a uh, Dex Athletics roll from you specifically? This should be not a problem for Vera, as she is a tourier door of high dexterity. Good. I got two successes. Not my best. That's fine. Uh, would you like to use a willpower in reroll three? Sure. Why not? I love it. Let I me mean, milk that will. There wow, you, go. you crit. A That's critical perfect. success. So that Here's now what... becomes five. So as you approach the hotel, John slams on the brakes as he arrives and the bucket goes flying almost. However, with a critical success, before the bucket can skid nearly two inches off uh, from the ground, Vera nimbly is able to land her foot in front of it and use that momentum to easily place her arm right under the hook and pull it before it spills. It's, not a it's single like drop. Mom. Yeah, tripping over a Lego with her glass of wine. I keep it completely 100% perfectly uh, level. <laughs> Up front, we see uh, John 
throw it into park like very aggressively as he almost struggles with it. And he looks over to Bob and he goes, sir, we're here. Yeah, uh, all right, uh, he, he bangs on the back. Poof, poof, poof. We can uh, get out now. Cool, is this where we're seeing the prince? I hope this is where we get to stay in our nice hotel and have a couple nights rest. I'm exhausted. And I'm still carrying around a guy in a bucket. That depends on the prince and what happens when you guys meet. But uh, at least, uh, you know, you're good for now. Uh, Max, even though he plans to obfuscate, uh, as per usual, Ben Grimm's up. So, uh, you know, it's a sunglasses, scarf, pull up the <laughs> yeah. hood, and uh, button everything up. Who rolls open the back of the truck? Sean busts open the door and okay. holds it for everyone. We can hear it clatter as it <laughs> rolls all the way up. And in front of you is a how many story hotel uh, exactly, Duke? <laughs> I, Did you forget? I, I don't, know don't you, remember uh, the amount. Of, uh, I didn't know if you remember how many size. floors it was. <laughs> What does it look like then, uh, Duke? This rather nice set of digs compared to where you once were staying far to the east in New York speaks of much uh, speaks volumes of the of the lengths you've come and the successes you've seen. Well, I mean, this this hotel is 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 a far shift, right? It's um, it's the Blackstone. There's a lot of history in this place. The Blackstone itself. Um, was chosen personally by Duke for a myriad of reasons, uh, if not for anything else. The fact that it suits sort of our needs. The, the, the coterie is not traditional by any sense of the means. In the Blackstone, well, it's widely recognized as one of the, the heralding points of, of criminal um, origin when it comes to uh, stomping grounds, that sort of thing. Uh, it's where they held the daytime transactions. There was a lot of business agreements that were held specifically in the spot. Um, hell, it was the first place of the organized crime convention um, by um, Charles Lucky Luciano, uh, which is a fairly prolific Italian gangster. Um, <laughs> this place is it's established. Okay, it's 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 hard to to, to give you all the, the the general details, but it's 335 units. Um, it's enormous, and it is it's recognized as part of the the large scale autograph collection uh, out of uh, Chicago. You're talking class. It is beautiful, a haven suitable to your station, Vera, to all the hard work and dedication and sacrifices that you made in New York over your many years as Scourge, then going undercover, all leads to this comfort, peace, everything you've earned. As you all, one by one, step out of the vehicle and meet in the landing area where the double doors sit, they swing open, and one gentleman in a suit, you may put him at like 20 years old, maybe 21, steps toward a group of you. Bob, you recognize this face, though you don't know a name. He's a lackey to the prince, nothing more. A messenger, an errand boy, as needed. And as he approaches, he gives you a nod, Bob, and looks to the four new faces in Chicago. Well, if Bob Kowalski's with you, I imagine at least one of you is Vera. And he kind of like locks eyes with the only female. Though I make yeah, assumptions. Yeah, and you know what? We are not in New York. Vera has no reason to hide her face. And in this kind of light bulb moment, Vera takes her hat off. And her blonde hair comes billowing down <laughs> wow. and she gets to actually like show her face for a hot minute. Um, and she smiles, a big grinning smile. She's very proud today to be Vera Yes, of course. I am Vera Volkov. He keeps his hands uh, firmly behind him. He stands completely upright and he gives a nod. There may have been a smirk that crawled across his lips in pleasantry, but it was hard to tell. As he lifts his head back up, Prince Jackson then is looking to meet with well the five of you. And he smiles at Bob. Good, we have a package delivery. He, there's not a reaction as you hold a bucket dangling from your uh, from your hand, completely stand, in stark contrast to the presentation that Vera is, a weird old bucket pulled out of a maintenance cabinet in an old graveyard, and then Vera, who is 
straight up and down dressed to the nines. Uh, he simply nods and turns on his heel and begins to walk. The double doors are opened by uh, people who clearly work for this hotel and I imagine expects you to follow. Do you simply follow or do you let him walk away? I think a follow. Oh, yes. I, I imagine so. I might give an eye, like a cut eye to Duke. They were still not sold entirely. This is almost too good to be true. Duke is, is moving fairly pensively. There's uh, some apprehension here, specifically with Bob still involved, and we're getting this grand meat from the prince. Uh, there's something that's a bit too sweet and, and bitter about this right now. Hey, there ain't nothing sweet about me. I'm all barbecue sauce. Even barbecue is sweet, Bob. Okay, fair enough. Uh, not if you go vinegar-based. Vinegar-based, that's more tangy. See, that's Chicago style. As the camera turns from this guy walking into the building and uh, we get a close-up of Vera as she darts eyes to Duke before she strolls away first and shortly followed by Duke, I imagine Bob is relatively comfortable also just heading straight in. I'm oh, curious I'm if there's any... In. That's what I figured. And I'm curious if there's any hesitation between Max and Sean. Uh, I think if there is any slight hesitation, uh, Max just sort of leans over to Sean and says, come on, kid, let's go. You got to keep up with your daddy, don't you? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be a good boy from now on. Uh, or whatever. Please don't ever say that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> As Vera doesn't boy. even turn her head, she simply mumbles that loud enough so you can hear it as she kind of walks off. Eventually, as all five of you file your, file your way into a gorgeous uh, marble tile floor, uh, a concierge not uh, nearby for dealing with a few different customers, uh, you're led past all of that. Um, there is uh, hotel rooms on your left and your right as the, all of you approach an elevator. And as it's called, the six of you file in. The gentleman leading you through hits the highest floor and the elevator begins to ascend. There's maybe about a minute of time spent in this elevator. And what I imagine is an awkward silence unless anybody chooses to break it. Um, but as that silence is eventually broken by that cliche ding and the rolling of elevator doors, uh, before you is a uh, multiple, uh, about three different doors. One on the left, one at the end of the hall, and one on the right, all different grand suites. And you're led directly down the hall to a door that is, before can even be knocked on, swung open. Inside, sat at the center of what is considered the meeting area of this suite, this, this room, that living room or, or such, lies a large rectangular oaken table. Sitting at the head of it is a tall black man with a shaved head and piercing amber eyes. He sits with a uh, perfectly tailored black suit a white shirt and a red tie that sits perfectly tucked into his uh, jacket front. Both of his hands are covered by white gloves and his dress pants and shoes look like they cost more than anything you've ever seen put together in your lives. He's having brief conversation with a young boy who maybe he looks to be a young teenager, but he's rather tall. There's words to be said or quickly said and as he finishes up, that boy stands, and you can clearly see uh, a rather beat-up t-shirt that says Baby Chorus on it. There's a nod between the two, and he steps back a couple of steps as what you now assume is Kevin Jackson stands to greet the five of you. His hands go by his side as he tightens the gloves, and he gives a nod, but doesn't say anything first. As you all file in, maybe quietly, the door shuts behind you. Does anybody say anything? I look to Bob. Because, you know, every prince has their own way of doing things. Like, does he bow? Does he, uh, you know, fist bump? What is Jackson's vibes? Hey, how you, you doing, prince? And I, I fist bump him. <laughs> as, as Bob walks up and, and goes for the fist bump, um, there is a moment of hesitation as the, as the prince uh, gives you a smirk. And he simply says, while he, ne he has never returned a fist bump, doesn't have not stopped you from trying, he gives you a, a, a smirk and says, oh, it's good to see you, Mr. Kowalski. Please, take a seat. Okay, well, hey, I just wanted to let you know, uh, they did good. 
as you can see. I'm happy to hear that. Now, Mr. Kowalski, a lingering question is, were you able to determine if these were the ones that caused the kerfuffle in New York? Yes, very openly in front of all of you, but is clearly only looking at Bob. I would say, uh, if I held up a magic eight ball and shook it, it would say all signs point to yes. He simply gives you a nod before his gaze turns back to the four of you. I smile and try not to look guilty. Well, I suppose uh, it depends what you mean by kerfuffle and which kerfuffle you mean. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to meet you, um, Prince. Um, I think Kowalski's got most of the story, but I'd say that we solved the problem. Yeah, and uh, we don't intend for no kerfuffles to be happening here in Chicago. It's true. In fact, we cleaned up your little mess, and I present the bucket and drop it to kind of to the floor just a little bit as it sloshes. See? Um, clean as it can be. Um, the young boy who was speaking to Jackson steps forward wordlessly, bends down and picks the bucket up and walks back to his position, placing it behind him. He looks for a few more moments. Jackson kind of like lets this weird silence sit before he uh, speaks. Don't tell me that you've already forgotten the tradition of introduction. Not at all. How dare I? I'm. It's been a while since I've had to introduce myself, having lived in New York for many decades. I'm. I'm Vera Volkov, of course. Um, and as, as like, she gesture, wipe my hands to everybody else before before you like as you do that awkwardly, and he goes, Vera Volkov of which clan? Of Clan Toriador. He nods. Then he looks over to. Who would be ever closest to Vera? I imagine it's probably Max. Yeah, Max is usually uh, at Vera's right hand. Uh, and uh, he reaches up, pulls off his sunglasses and scarf, and pulls back the hood. And goes, hey, nice to meet you, Prince. What's the rumpus? I'm Max. As you can tell, I am also a Toriador. You get a genuine smile out of him again. Uh, a Nosferatu with humor is rare. His eyes trail over to Duke. Sean's yeah, Sean's gonna take a like minute step back and let Duke do the talking for him. Duke takes a single step forward and gives a curt nod, introducing himself. I'm Duke Premond, uh, the Ventru clan. And this is my childer. Sean, introduce yourself. Uh sir, so I'm Sean Best. I wasn't aware New York was allowing the embrace of new kindred these nights. It's weird how things work out, but I'm sure you've heard that New York is constantly in a state of flux. He uh, maintains eye contact with you, Duke, and gives a subtle nod. You see his left foot tap as his eyes seem to be lost in thought for a minute. I'm assuming that the paperwork and the transition of the Black Stone is moving forward in accordance with the negotiations of the Prince of New York. He takes a moment and he says, funny how situations can change, Mr. Kremond. Please, the four of you, take a seat, business to discuss, and welcome to Chicago. I think you'll see um, Duke wait a moment and cast that glance of like, here it comes, Tavera. I glance it back with a hopeful glint in my eye that it can only get better, right? Changes, changes for the better as I take a seat. Yeah, Sean sits down pretty quick. <laughs> also, uh, Bob notices very specifically that he said you four take a seat, so he kind of stands there awkwardly. <laughs> uh, as, he, as, as Bob gets up from his seat, Jackson turns to him uh, and he goes, Bob, you may stay seated. Oh, oh, okay, okay, thanks, Prince. You know, you can never be too sure. <laughs> As you all take a seat, uh, Jackson will be the last one 
to sit in his chair, pull it in, and uh, the boy walks over with a manila folder, plopping it directly in front of Jackson. As Jackson brings both his hands forward and slowly begins to move, remove the glove on his right hand. Your entrance into Chicago comes at a tumultuous time, it seems, for the Camarilla across the entire uh, United States. The fall of L.A., the flux happening in New York. I don't know details, but I have my, I have my informants. What happened in New York? Details, please. As he pulls the last finger off of the right glove and opens the manila folder, slowly peeling away at different papers that were held together by a paper clip. Would you like the long or the short of it? Whatever gives me the fullest story, Mr. Premond. Long story short, there was an attempt on the prince's life. And we followed the tenants of the Camarilla. We did what we thought was best. We helped to reinstate the actuating prince. In their time of need, we were there to stand over them and guard. I imagine as a long-standing or even short-standing prince of Chicago, you understand how important it is to have knights in your corner watching over you in your weakest moments. Yes, word in New York right now is that uh, the Anarchs have been making rather bold moves, redrawing la lines that were once settled. I'll be curious how it pans out for Panhard. And it was your doing then that Panhard was able to return. By the time word that she was missing had come my way, she had already been found again. Like Duke said, we watched over her in her time of need. There again, he seems not particularly fussed one way or another, taking in this information. Another crinkle of a paper as he flips over to the uh, other side. Are you aware of the kindred, both of elder age and of younger age, that perished that night at Elysium? I don't have solid numbers yet, but I'm told it was more than a handful. Duke nods. Well, I want to make it clear. Chicago is not New York. Our stability is stronger than any of the cities you seemingly resided. I am a patient man and a fair man. As he says that, he looks directly to Max. I do not see high nor low clans, only a kindred that must remain united. But transgressions are not to be overlooked. Laws get broken. Punishments are dueled out fairly. Even if that punishment is death, there will be no flux of power, no usurpation. Chicago is a settled matter. In fact, we're expanding. Chicago is the first city to openly welcome those of the La Sombra clan. Well, Sombra have been making large moves, seemingly questioning their decision to be that of Sabat and looking to work their way back into our good graces. My city is the only one prepared to handle such things at this moment, and I plan to keep it that way. With that said, Mr. Premond, as his eyes go from Vera to Duke, the paperwork was impressive. I wasn't able to immediately find out who was attempting to buy this. Unfortunately, the world, it's chaos. Perhaps you haven't heard, but this building, once belonging, or still does in some way, to the Luciano family, well, the Lucianos have had a shakeup as of late. Left loose ends. Proprietors and investors don't know where to go, and... Chicago is my city. I took care of the problem. Your name got lost in the shuffle, unfortunately, and the hotel belongs to me. Lucianos are good people, after all. But I am not a prince to turn a blind eye onto those coming to my city, not with just a need, but with talent, clearly. As I said just moments ago, the Camarilla is, has stability issues. 
There's a small town nearby. Gary, Indiana. Was run by the Camarilla for some time. But the prince disappeared. I assume, similar to New York, perhaps an assassination attempt gone well. One would think the Anarchs would step in, but they too seem to have lost the head. It won't be long before another snake takes its place. But in the meantime, Gary is unruly. I wish to put my thumb on those who wish to rise against the Camarilla and remind them that Gary, Indiana, should the need come, falls under the protection of Chicago. That's where you will be coming in. As the camera finally peels away from Jackson's face and slowly turns to the others at the sitting at the table, I'm curious do we see visible reactions? Vera's going to try really hard not to let him see her reaction. Would you like to make a roll? <laughs> Is that a composure roll? Yep. <laughs> Is that a, um, just a flat Resolve, it would be like roll? a resolve composure roll. Okay. It's important he doesn't know that I'm upset. It is important to Vera that he does not know how upset <laughs> she is right now. Like, under the table, her fingernails are slowly clawing away at the vinyl on her legs. Are, like you, are you saying um, you're going to uh, add no, a... No, no. Okay. I'm, I am, I am going to use a willpower and add two dynamics. Okay, this. that's fine. I am. Uh... I... I will say that Max, knowing Vera as well as he does, he he doesn't yeah, care. I figured... it's like Gary and the end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good. But he knows he knows Vera. So like when this hat, like you just see Max's eyes go <laughs> right over to uh, right over to Vera to take in her reaction. Uh, hey, so I... you've rolled three successes with what is technically a messy critical. So Can I smile. <laughs> At Jackson really hard. Perhaps the the messy critical is that while on the outward you look extremely calm, you are unable to say a word lest you lose your temper. So you maintain yeah. silence. Duke and, uh, well, obviously Max is, uh, you said he's kind of relaxed about it, but looks immediately over to Vera. What about Duke and Sean? And if Max wants to say something or Bob wants to say something, Bob, here's what I'll tell you. You know about Gary. It's a shithole. That's it's been abandoned, not abandoned, but not a lot of people live there anymore. And as far as the kindred situation was, even when the Camarilla was running it, it was still very messy. Uh, it's chaos. Uh, I will say that Max just sort of, you know, when it's mentioned, starts humming the, you know, Gary Indiana <laughs> song, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. But again, yeah, he 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 doesn't mind. It's like, sure, good as place as any. I mean, in my opinion, Max could just walk down the middle of the street in Gary, Indiana, and nobody would notice. <laughs> He'd fit right in. Does Bob say that out loud? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, that's hilarious. It's going to be great Jackson for you, says, Max. Uh, <laughs> well, looks like that's uh, one in the plus column there, Bob. It says everything to Vera that she needs to know about Gary, Indiana. And she sings a little <laughs> bit more. I think Duke waits to see if this this pause is going to linger from the prince, if he's actually oh, waiting sure. for a response. Well, there was like a slight response as as Max okay. and Bob both spoke. Um, did Sean, does Sean, I'm just curious if you, the rest of you say anything at all. Sean doesn't say anything, but he just has a look on his face of like uh, e an eager to please face because inside he's just thinking... Oh, of course we've got given another job. Okay, no, I, I saw this coming a mile off. This is expected. I'm just going to wait for Vera and Duke sure, to get sure. the info, lead us into battle, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and he looks over at them, and I think his heart probably drops a little bit. Like, Duke, oh, no, we might be in trouble. <laughs> Duke unbuttons and rolls up his sleeves at this point. Oh, <laughs> oh no. no. Oh, no. Uh, now he, um, uh, after that's, okay, so if that's the response then, uh, Kevin will continue. He doesn't let silence linger. Prince, um, if, if, okay. I, if I may. Please, Mr. Prem. 
you'd receive the paperwork of which you'd gone over. You saw the negotiations with the prince, which was not just a minor squabble. This is not pocket change. It was a multi-million dollar deal, of which I know you've read. You said it was impressive. Now we've moved ourselves across state lines, many of which we've had to stay black bagged in places of ill comfort to find our way to a podunk graveyard to clean up a mess that wasn't ours. And the moment that we cross into your territory, a place of such well-known reputation, a place of expansion, we're immediately disgusted of our own reputation, ask if we were part of a kerfluffle. I like to think that we were fixers, solvers of an issue. We saved a princedom, a prince, we saved a sheriff. We did many things, of which I'm not asking for accolades, I'm simply asking for respect. Ventru to Ventru, you're asking us to take on more dirty work. All fair points, Mr. Premen, but perhaps you fail to understand that all the facts that you lay before me are known by a very select few. Those who are aware of you and who you are likely place you at the epicenter of the events that happen in New York, and I highly doubt that the truth of the matter will find its way to the streets beyond those who already know. If word got out that I was harboring potential terrorists of the Camarilla here in Chicago on good faith, that could shake the foundry and the stability of Chicago itself. Now, you don't have to agree with playing politics, but if you are coming from New York, then... I'd hope all of you understand that things are not so cut and dry. Look, uh, Prince, we get it. We're new fish. We're pretty much going to have to do what you say. This is your place. We just got here. What do you need? What I'm proposing is more than just a cleanup job, you understand. I'm proposing an opportunity for you to clear your name, not simply just here, and to prove yourself that you are who you claim to be in front of me this night, but to make a large gesture for the Camarilla, to bring an entire town back under its thumb after potentially losing one with a... with a graceful acceptance and gift the Camarilla such as that, I can see no reason why you don't get what you're already here for and more. Well, we're nothing if not graceful, right, gang? True. Oh, the most graceful. Absolute picture of poise. And who are we to be ungrateful, right, everyone? Prince Jackson. I guess you could say we spent quite a lot of our resources to require, acquire this hotel. Now we're heading to Gary, Indiana, with nothing in our pockets, including a place to rest our heads. He uh, looks down to, his, to the papers in front of him and flips to the final page. I, of course, am not going to send you in without a place to stay. I'm also aware that there's more of your belongings arriving in Chicago. Yeah, not just belongings, also, uh, well, my child. He, uh, he nods to that, uh, but uh, doesn't say anything. All those that follow, kind, may stay within the safeties and protections of Chicago proper. Kindred, however, must go with you. Okay. Beyond well. that, Bob will be going with you. Bob. Oh, man! <laughs> <laughs> I imagine the whole time he's like kicked back, <laughs> relaxed, taking all this in, enjoying the political drama. <laughs> um, as he says, oh, man, I apologize, Mr. Kowalski, but it should be the last thing I need from you for a while. The <laughs> Prince's Have. Yes. Sorry, Bob. Looks like you stuck with well, us for a little you know, bit. Maybe huh? I can help clean up Gary a little bit, too, and can be a new vacation spot, right? Oh, yes. Gary, Indiana. I mean, the prince said it himself. We've got talent. So 
We, we can do it. Easy. Yeah. I reckon Bones Break in Gary, Indiana, just as easy as anywhere else, right? And he cracks Nick just his sits knuckles. back and putting his hand on his face. My prince, um, it seems we have a variety of tactics that we could use to bring Gary under your steadfast rule. Is there a particular way you might like us to achieve your means? The first is simple. Anarchs have decided to make a mockery of the Camarilla and have holed up in the prince's once domain. Root them out. All of them. Make sure that they aren't submissive. They see the sunlight. There is... I'm sorry. For clarification, you have no interest in converting them. Only getting rid of them. Uh, uh, he, he kind of simply nods to that. They piss on the safety that was once the Camarillas. No transgression is greater. Okay, kill them all. That's pretty easy, huh? Once that is done, his haven belongs to you. I'm sorry. If we clear out the prince's the haven, anarchs, squatting in the prince's haven, it becomes ours. You will reside there. I am not able to extend more of my soldiers to Gary at the moment. Hey, uh, Prince, uh, just to clarify, uh, I can come back to Chicago, right? After this? I don't got to stay there? No, okay, okay. You should stay with us, though. Mr. You're part Cole. of the drag pack now. Is that? Is that? And, that, and then he oh, takes yeah, a moment and he raises uh, his eyebrows. Ah. A coterie who takes a name like so many others here. The drag pack. Yeah, we got, uh, we got t-shirts and everything. Mr. Kowalski. He smiles and turns to you. You're always welcome back into Chicago. Okay, I, I don't know what I what I would do if I if I couldn't stay here. I, I my whole identity, as you can see, is kind of wrapped up in Chicago. <laughs> so, Mr. Jackson uh... smiles. Your debts have been paid ten times over, Mr. Kowalski. You and I both are aware of that. I just I don't know if I could be a Cleveland Browns fan. You know what I mean? So, all right. Um, um and and just for more clarification. The same applies to us as it does, it does to Bob. We too are allowed to come back to this hotel when we have achieved your... When all is said and done, we will meet again here in this hotel. Wonderful. Okay. Well. I got, uh, I guess, a logistical question. Um, if my child's got to come with me, then we got to wait till she gets here. Understood. Beyond that, I extend to you the powers of Hound and Sheriff within Gary, Indiana itself. There are Camarilla that still attempt to maintain safety there. You are not to claim yourselves as Sheriff, but the rules of fighting for your own hold. If you can maintain your territory and your domain, then it is yours under Camarilla law. Then under Camarilla law, are we allowed to exact certain things to exemplify our survival? I imagine so. Do you have an example in mind, Mr. Premon? To be precise with you, I'm looking for some sort of social and Camarilla-based indemnity or immunity from Diablery. A very specific request. If it means that we can succeed in meeting your request while in Gary, if it means our survival, we have to Diablerize. I would like clarity of safety of our survival moving forward while moving back in Chicago. The answer is no. Diablerie runs a risk. As I'm sure you understand, Mr. Premon, even if you survived, it is an addictive feeling, and even if the person in question or kindred in question wasn't very strong, you run the risk of losing your body to them. No. We wouldn't know anything about uh... that. What about uh, punching all the way through somebody's head? Are you fine with that? Yes. Okay. Then we're in business. Gary is to be reminded that it is a Camarilla city. Regardless if there is a prince sat there at the moment. Prince Jackson. I don't often bring up my personal past, but I would be 
dishonest if I did not say that I hesitate to take on your strong hand in Gary, Indiana, as I have left the title of Scourge a long time ago. I don't really kill Kindred anymore. For good reason. I'll take the title. I hoped to say, start anew, try a different way. The only outcome I care to see is Gary secured. Do it as you will. And uh, we can say that we're acting on your behalf, the behalf of the Camarilla. Should that come back to bite me? Should you turn tail and change your mind after you've left Chicago and I catch word that you've began working with the other side, I will dispatch my finest to dispatch of you. Do you understand? Yeah, you don't got to worry about that. Crystal clear. I'm sure a tense silence settles over the table for a moment like that. Just thank you for your time, Prince Jackson. I imagine we'll have to wait an evening. The rest of your company and belonging should be here by tomorrow eve. Once everybody's got what they need, I will arrange transportation to Gary. And Bob is at our disposal. He smiles. Bob is under no one's disposal but mine, but he will be joining you, yes. Hey. Uh, oh, my my nickname, you know, back in the day was the garbage disposal, but that's a completely different thing. Charming. I feel I learned something <laughs> new of you every day, Mr. Kowalski. Um, one last thing there, Prince. Uh, since we're going on a mission for you, might we be able to, shall we say, raid your armory? There's a few things I could use. Might make the job a little easier. I'll be sending you with uh, uh, <clears throat> he, uh, clear my third and try that again. He, um, I will be sending you to Gary, armed and funded. I will bankroll you to a certain percentage and assure that you settle in Gary as well as you can. But that monetary benefit will only come through once you've secured your haven. Well, then we should not wait any longer. If I may, there are kind who worked for us without realizing it, as many do. I'm unsure if they're aware that management has changed. But if they were to be made aware, I imagine it wouldn't be that much of a difficult proposition to convince them to continue working with us. Smaller gangs arms dealers, truck dealers, and the like. Now that's more our speed. Do you think you could have your people send our people some details on the current political scope of Gary and anybody we should have knowledge of that may still function there? I'll send you a list of names, but the political situation of Gary is damn near chaos. If a prince doesn't take seat, I will take it myself. Now you mentioned uh, cash and whatnot. It's not going to come through until we've delivered. But uh, up front, you think you could help out with some more practical stuff, equipment, that kind of thing? I'll see what I can do, but I'm sure I can provide you things that would benefit you greatly. Until then. Fair enough. The three suites up here are blacked out, safe and kindred only. They are yours for the evening. How kind of you. If I can provide food, I'll have three sent up. Is there a particular, and he looks over to, uh, first to Sean, and then to Duke? I'm not hungry. And you, Sean. You got any thin butts? (laughs) <laughs> that is a funny joke. <laughs> is that your particular taste? Uh, I have a preference. I'm I'm picky in other ways, though. So, 
So out of curiosity, does Duke do... Duke is beside himself. He's like, he's completely tuned out yeah. everything but the prince's voice at this point. Vera knows this is going to go really bad if we don't get Duke out of That's here fine. soon. Uh, so. As, as uh, Sean finishes that, then you are dismissed for now. Enjoy your rooms. I'll have food sent up. I'll see what I can do for you, Sean. Uh, yeah, there, Prince. Uh, speaking of food, uh, I don't really need mine on the hoof, so to speak. Provide. Uh, bag is just... fine. Cold, congealed. He I just ain't nods. fancy. That shouldn't be a problem, Max. And uh, just, in, just in case you forgot, for me, it's always somebody who hopefully just ate some pork chops. <laughs> oh. I always seem to forget that, Mr. Kowalski. I'll see what I can do this evening. Kevin Jackson stands up first, sliding his gloves, uh, his glove on. Um, but he stand when he stands. Every, I assume, yeah, everybody kind of stands in sync. I hope the three of you have a good night. Uh, but before we depart, may I have a word with the Duke, please? Of course, Prince. Of course, you may. Okay, well, uh, we'll just make ourselves scarce then. And, and Max does actually. He's just like, oh, I don't yeah. want to get around for this. Uh, good luck, Daddy. I make eyes with Duke. How's Duke doing? There is no blink. There is no. <laughs> it's like staring at a park bench. Um, Vera's concerned about leaving them alone, so she will leave the room, but she stays just outside in the hallway in case things go awry. And the the young man who's there stays in the room. Uh, he doesn't leave. Duke, uh, I imagine, just unblinking and unerringly staring at Jackson. Uh, Jackson watches everybody leave, and when the door finally shuts, they snap over back to you. Mr. Premond, I'm not here to levy accusations. But what is Sean? I've never met a venture who doesn't understand their own restrictions before on feeding. And... The Blue Bloods, ourselves, like you and me, tend to have particular tastes. Are you looking for my curt answer here? I'm looking for a reason to continue trusting you. There are many reasons one would hide their clan. Sean was a mistake. It was a mistake for a lot of reasons. And he is not yours. It was not mine, no. But I've taken control. I've existed in this place long enough to know when someone needs some tutelage. Sean was a thin blood prince. You said that you had your eyes and ears in New York. If that's accurate, then you already know that he was a thin blood. The details are scant, one form. I am aware that there was a terrorist attack in New York City, and the potential perpetrators were seen leaving the city heading west. I sent a few of my own out. It just seemed that Bob Kowalski was the first to discover you. Point being is, I'm not here to out Sean. I realize that you're not attempting to point fingers. It might be a bit of a mistake to label us even if rumor-based as terrorists. I agree. We were the only leg left on the table that kept Camarilla alive in New York. There was a terrorist attack, quite a vicious one. As a meatsy with a bit of a chip on his shoulder discovered a way to arm Thin Bloods with sunlight, allowing them to explode he cuts you there and he said I had heard something to that effect but it sounded like rumors of Tremere blood magic as always I can assure you that it's not a rumor many died and this is how it wasn't some inquisition movement you can understand with all of these things that have occurred to us in such a short span even hearing the rumors, knowing that there is some truth in all of it. Our movement here, the negotiations, the protection, everything we exhausted to move 
in this direction to the one place that we had heard was a safe haven. A place of brilliance and growth, Chicago, under your rule, to be labeled as a terrorist, and to continue to prove over and over again just how loyal we are to the Camarilla. I truly, truly do feel for your plight. And while I may believe every word, my word cannot carry that if the Justicars arrive and deem you criminals. I need to see an outward, open example of loyalty to the Camarilla, and this is the best I can offer you while you're here. If you wish to go to L.A., well, there's an open opportunity to retake L.A. if you think you can do so, and I'm sure they'd be very, very happy. No, sir, I think not. I forgive my candid and... and... There is no need to apologize, Mr. Prem, and just understand this. I do not wish to know or out what or who Sean is. But if he's going to play at a blue blood like us, perhaps ensure he understands our most basic restrictions. As far as I'm, as far as I am concerned, as far as Damien is concerned, as he looks back to the boy, Sean is your child and he is Ventrue, even if an imposter. Just note this, Prince. There is a specific reason that I asked for social and Cam Camarilla-based immunity and indemnity for Diablerie. It is not my intention to move there. It is my intention to protect my child. I see. Some of us rarely have choices in our lives and on lives. Sean has had even less than we have. It is unlikely his secret would find its way out in Gary. But should it find its way out here, ideally by then, you've all ingratiated yourselves into the Camarilla, and we can let bygones be bygones. As far as I'm concerned, continuing, I will overlook this transgression, as it did not happen within my domain, nor under my law. Under terrorist attacks in New York, survival was something that was a bit hard to clutch on to. Sean Dim simply did what he had to, to survive, and I have no qualms with going to Gary to clean up. I've been great at it, as it was previously an elected position, and I took up happily so. My history mm -hmm. dictates as such, I'm good at it, I'll continue to do it. Just looking for... Honestly, Prince, I don't know what I'm looking for. Just trying to make it to tomorrow, I assume. Well, I'm eager to see why Cesar was so hesitant to let go of his favorite possession then. He'll forever have my gratitude. Please enjoy the rest of your evening here, Mr. Premond. I have business to attend to, and I look forward to seeing the four of you tomorrow evening. I have to have words with Mr. Kowalski. Have a good night. Good evening, Prince. And as he walks away with Damien in lockstep behind him, our camera sits right behind Duke's shoulder. And as the door to the suite shuts and it rotates to watch the lingering dead eyes of Duke holding steadfast on that door, we hold for a beat before we cut to black. And we'll see you next week with episode two, everybody. Bye. Oh, hi, mortals. It's me, Vera Volker, here to ask you for a little favor. As you may know, the club is currently under renovations, and we could use all the resources to get back on our feet. You can help us by either joining our Patreon or visiting tpublic.com and getting your grubby little fingers on a custom drag pack t-shirt. Well... What are you waiting for?